I discovered something interesting on my last longer term fast. I discovered that my blood sugar actually elevated during my fast. And it got me wondering, was I making myself diabetic? Was I making myself insulin resistant? So it encouraged me to do a little bit of research and kind of uncover exactly what's going on. And it makes perfect, perfect sense. And there's a lot of bodies of evidence in terms of research to back everything up. So the question at hand for today's video is, does fasting make you metabolically flexible? Does it make it so that your body can use fats better? Or does it just make it so that your body just doesn't use carbs as well? So it's gonna be very important stuff. So I encourage you to stick with me through the entirety of this video as we talk about prolonged fasting and shorter term fasting. But hey, you are tuned in to the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. New videos coming out every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, and a bunch of other videos peppered in between as well. Also, make sure that you check out highly.com for the latest and greatest performance apparel that I'm always wearing in my videos. All right, so let's break down insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity really quick. Okay, insulin sensitivity is the ability for your cells to absorb glucose. If you're insulin sensitive, they're gonna be a lot more apt to absorbing glucose that's in your bloodstream. Obviously, a diabetic is not insulin sensitive. Their body does not do a good job at absorbing the glucose in the bloodstream, which is why it stays elevated. But there's actually three different kinds of insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity that we should look at. We have peripheral insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. Peripheral is like your body's cells, like your muscle cells and things like that, the peripheral cells. Okay, it's the ability for your muscle cells to absorb carbohydrates. Okay, then we have hepatic insulin sensitivity or hepatic insulin resistance. This is all occurring in your liver, the liver's ability to accept carbohydrates or the liver's ability to not accept carbohydrates. Okay, then we have what's called beta cell insulin sensitivity or beta cell insulin resistance. A perfect example is gonna be a type one diabetic. They do not produce insulin because the beta cells within their pancreas are insulin resistant. They don't do a good job of seeing the glucose that's coming in, so they never produce insulin, which is exactly why a type one diabetic has to take an insulin shot. Okay, so let's talk about how this all has to work with fasting, okay? This isn't a video about diabetes or anything like that. It's about a normal person and what you're gonna encounter and why you shouldn't really be concerned. So simply put, when you fast for a longer period of time, you're not ingesting glucose, okay? So in theory, you wouldn't have an increase in blood sugar, but the result is actually different. A lot of times you do see an increase in blood sugar, and this is what I uncovered on my last three-day fast. I found that my blood sugar increased when I measured it, so it got me a little bit confused. But what's actually happening is your body is getting more efficient at using fats, so it takes the glucose that's still going to be released from your muscles and from your liver, and it shuttles it up to the brain. But what you'll find is that the cells within your body don't accept that glucose nearly as well. So your blood glucose goes higher because your cells are becoming insulin resistant. They're not accepting that glucose. So of course your number reads higher. Now there's a study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Okay, it took a look at a few participants that did a 60 hour fast or a 12 hour fast. And they had them also look at them with aspirin or without aspirin. But honestly, the aspirin is kind of irrelevant here. Okay, so what they found is that at the end of a 60 hour fast, the participants ended up having a 46% reduction in insulin mediated glucose uptake within the skeletal muscle tissue. What that means in very layman's terms is that they had a 46% decrease in the body's ability to absorb glucose into the muscle cell. Whoa, that sounds bad, right? You normally want to be insulin sensitive. You normally want your bodies to be able to do a lot with a little bit of carbohydrates but they actually found that during a fast, the cells sort of shut off the capability of absorbing the glucose. And the reason that they did that was to preserve the glucose for the brain. That's right, when you're fasting, your brain is still using glucose, but it's using glucose that it pulls from protein stores or it pulls from your skeletal muscle tissue that's already there because the rest of the body gets adapted to running on fats. This, my friends, is a very good thing. But the cool thing is, with this study, they actually found that there were no signs of hyperinsulinemia or no signs of hyperglycemia. Okay, so what this means is that we had an increase in blood sugar, but we didn't have the negative effects of it. You see, normally in like diabetics or anything like that, if you have high levels of blood sugar, you're gonna have these hyperglycemia effects. You're gonna feel lightheaded, you're gonna get dizzy, all these things. None of that's occurring. Why? Because this is a natural physiological process. The body is adapting to the higher levels of blood sugar temporarily as it tries to figure out what cells need to run on fat and what cells need to run on sugar. 
Now, the other interesting thing that we have to look at is the mitochondrial function actually decreases. Now, I'm playing devil's advocate here because normally I'm all about heightening mitochondrial function. How do we improve the mitochondria's ability to create energy? For those of you that don't know, the mitochondria is a portion inside the cell that allows the body to create energy. It creates energy. So if we have a decrease in mitochondrial function, that sounds like a bad thing, but it's not quite that simple. You see, the mitochondria has a decrease in its ability to process glucose, but it has an increase in the ability to process fats. So it kind of balances out. It's not like it's a decrease in function. It's more of just an improvement in efficiency. So what's really cool to know is that your central nervous system and your brain don't require insulin to use glucose. Kind of think of them as electric, and they use that glucose as electricity. They don't need a special carrier pigeon to open up the cell door. Okay, the brain and the central nervous system can just run on the sugar, whereas the rest of the body's cells actually need the insulin to open it up. So basically, when you're fasting, the rest of the cells are using fat, and the glucose just goes up to the brain and supplies your brain and central nervous system with the energy that it needs. But where things start to get really interesting is it's not the absence of food that triggers this insulin resistance. See, researchers are actually finding it's the increase in the lipids. So what does that mean? That means that it's actually the increase of the fats in the bloodstream because of fasting. Okay, fats are going from your stored body fat into the bloodstream, therefore increase in fats. It's the increase in fats that are making you insulin resistant, which goes to show again and proves that the body is adapting to using fats and starts to sort of snub the glucose simply by having it available. So when you're fasting and your lipids increase, the body says, nah, I don't really need the glucose. Save that for the brain. Save that for the central nervous system. We'll gobble up those fats. Now what's intriguing is playing devil's advocate again, there was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes that found that after 60 hours of fasting, there was a ninefold increase in free fatty acid oxidation within the cell. Okay, I'll take that, a ninefold increase. So that means literally, in addition to not taking in any calories, your body just increased its ability to burn fat by nine times? Heck yeah, that sounds good. But this same study also found that again, there was a decrease, a pretty significant decrease in mitochondrial function that was correlated exactly with the increase in lipids and fat oxidation. So again, we come back to square one, where a lot of the people out there on the internet that are anti-fasting are gonna say, well, you're decreasing your mitochondrial function. So that means that your mitochondria is not nearly as good at creating energy. Well, no, not quite. Let me put it into a simple analogy for you. Okay, so you've got your cell here. Normally, it's gonna be taking in glucose. Glucose has four calories per gram, right? Carbohydrates have four calories per gram. Fats have nine calories per gram. So even if your mitochondrial function decreased in half, it was able to use fats instead of carbohydrates you're still at a net neutral, even net positive energy with the fat than you are with the carbs. So again, the mitochondria just got more efficient at utilizing a different fuel source. A perfect example is going to be a Tesla versus a Lamborghini. A Tesla can do zero to 60 in, I don't even know what, really fast. And then you've got a Lamborghini that can do zero to 60 and probably equally as fast. Okay, well, one is going to be more efficient, doesn't use as much fuel, and the Lamborghini is gonna use a bunch of fuel. So it's still getting there, but it doesn't have as much output, as much function or energy that's going into it, whereas the Tesla harnesses that energy and is a little bit more efficient. Now, I'm not a Tesla guy or a Lamborghini guy, but it's a perfect analogy that shows how the mitochondria is just becoming more efficient, not decreasing in function. But what gets really, really cool is all the bodies of evidence that start to find that we actually increase our metabolic flexibility. So it's not like we fast and our body only learns how to use fats at this point. I mean, that's great. But the cool thing is we increase our metabolic flexibility, which means when we're done fasting, our bodies now acquired the ability to use fats, but they also maintain the ability to still utilize glucose. This is again, fat adaptation at its finest. The more that you prolong fast, and the more that you do keto, and the more that you get fat adapted, the more that your body just gets used to using fats, whether you're fasting or not. So you might be wondering, just because overall mitochondrial function decreased, you might mean that body fat oxidation would decrease too. It's actually not the case. Researchers, again, have found that whole body fat oxidation doesn't change. It still stays elevated, even if mitochondrial function is decreased. Now, last but not least, throw in intermittent fasting, short fasting. Studies have found, even though it's hard to find the full abstract version of these studies, that short-term fasting increases insulin sensitivity. 
it increases that peripheral insulin sensitivity. So what we're finding here is that if you do a nice balance of short-term fasting and the occasional long-term fast, you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can make it so your body's more fat adapted, but at the same time, make it so you're insulin sensitive, so that your body can grab those carbohydrates when it needs to, so that you never have to deal with high blood sugar. So over time, your blood sugar might not skyrocket as high when you start out on a prolonged fast. I know this is a complex topic. If you have questions or you have ideas for other videos that will help clarify this, go ahead and put them down in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next video.